Hello the internet and welcome back to my channel. This is the continuation of a repair video of this Macintosh SC computer. Now if you haven't watched the video I strongly recommend you go and watch it. I'm gonna link it up here. At the end of the last episode I left you with a computer which basically was not working, which was barely powering up and uh, had mouse issues suddenly out of the blue. I would say let's resume from those two issues. As you can see I've got a keyboard this time, I have a replacement mouse and I finally received my floppy emu which is basically an SD card based floppy drive emulation for the Apple Macintosh. So there's quite a lot to do, so let's crack on and uh, let's start working again on this Macintosh. To be able to work at the top of the board and not just the bottom, which is uh, a bit inconvenient, I've been thinking of extending the power supply connector, which is always taking the video signal back to the analog board. I've been thinking of just, uh, you know, purchasing this connector and making it my own, buying the cables and everything. And then I found online a video, which I'm going to link down below if I can find it, with a super easy, cheap and fast solution. It looks like these connectors here, both the male and the female on the board, they retain the same keys and the same type of connectors of an ATX power supply extender. Now obviously the ATX connector is 24 pins, while this one is only 14 pins, but what happens is the connectors are keyed exactly in the same way. I can basically plug the Apple connector on one end only and I can do the same on the board. This is fitting exactly in this position. You won't fit in this position because this connector here is keyed as you, as you notice and probably for some standard the, the Apple Macintosh is keyed exactly in the same way. There you go. I have my motherboard extended with just a few pounds of ready-made power supply extender cable which you can buy online very easily. Now one other thing I need is the speaker connection. Obviously I want to hear what happens. So for this I've just used a couple of these, I don't know how to call this, I didn't have a one which was long enough so I just uh, I plugged two together. And now I'm able to power up the Macintosh with the board facing up and with the screen facing this way. This is incredibly easy and super useful. And now is the time we've been waiting for. So I have a keyboard, finally, and I have a replacement mouse which I haven't tested. So I only have the mouse connected at the time being. Will it work? Well, I hope it does, because if it doesn't, then it means we have an issue with the motherboard. Right, I'm about to boot the mouse in three, two, one, go. Oh, it doesn't work. <laughs> There's an issue with the motherboard. Ah, oh, okay. The next step is going to be to load a startup disk using the floppy emu and see if I can use the keyboard with the debug console. And we are in the desktop. The mouse does the same thing. So let's open the diagnostic console or debug console. There it is, and let's try and use the keyboard and see what happens. What is that? No, I'm typing D, not A. And now it stopped. So here's the situation. I only have the keyboard connected at the time being. If I open the, the debug console, basically each keystroke is four A's, but it's two A's if I press and two A's when I depress. And all the keys on the keyboard are producing the same exact action on screen. So I guess I'll need to take a look a bit deeper and try to understand. My concern is, again, the data lines, the address lines, everything seems to be working because the operating system is starting. I and mean, if there was an issue with that, I'm assuming it wouldn't work in the first place. So the fact that the keyboard is not working or is doing this thing and the mouse is not working, the only thing I can think is that the ADP chip is not working or the VIA is not working. I really can't think of anything else. There could be one easy option that I could try. I'm not sure how many of you would agree with me. I know this is not the Macintosh where normally capacitors fail and they're only a small bunch of capacitors which are all far away from the ADB section, but it doesn't really cost me anything to remove those capacitors, check them, maybe replace them and see if by any chance this comes back to life before I, number one, invest time into this and most importantly, spend money into this. I have the Fluke set for capacitance reading. I do know that multimeters are not great at reading capacitance. This Fluke is no exception. Also, when you're reading capacitance in circuits, it's more or less pointless. Still, there are only 10 capacitors here on the board. They're all uh, low values. Uh, I think we go, we go from one to 33 microfarad. And I've noticed that if I check the capacitance of these uh, components, 
they more or less read something like if I'm checking this one, for example, I'm getting a 40 microfarad reading, it's slightly a 33, so 40 is okay, but again, it doesn't matter, it's in circuit. But there are three capacitors here on the board, which if I try and read any capacitance at all, they don't read anything. It's just a uh, it feels a little bit weird. I'm just thinking, removing these capacitors is gonna take me half an hour. I don't necessarily like replacing all capacitors, but um, I would say, let me try and remove like at least this couple and see what they read. Capacitor is out. This is one that didn't read anything on the meter, so let's give it a go. This is supposed to be a 33 microfarad, so 38 is within spec, 20%. ESR, it might look high, but to be honest, for this value and for a 1990 capacitor, it's probably totally fine. Yeah, I'm a bit puzzled of what I should do now. You know what, as much as this might not be needed, I have the replacement, it really takes me just a few minutes. Let's go ahead and replace these capacitors. As expected, the new capacitors did not improve the situation. The mouse still doesn't work and the whole system struggles to post more and more. So let's move on with the next stage of the diagnostic. The first thing I want to do to diagnose this failure to boot up every now and then, which is getting like 50% of times now, I want to make sure that the power supply is actually engaging all the voltages in a reasonable time without hesitations or anything. Basically, I've connected the scope, my four channel scopes, to plus 5, plus 12, minus 5, minus 12. And I'm going to show you on screen what happens when I power up the Mac so we can take a look at the actual startup sequence of the power supply and see if there's anything which is uh, potentially causing this problem. What you see on screen is my oscilloscope. Each one of these traces is labeled, so I don't have to explain you what happens. And I guess we can just uh, power up and see what happens. This is in uh, roll mode. You see what's gonna happen in a second. Three, two, one, go. Well, I don't see anything weird, but I guess the best way would be to set a single trigger and then take a look at the traces. I'm triggering on channel 1, which is minus 12, with just a random voltage. And let's see what happens if I power up now. 3, 2, 1, go. So I would say, let's try and have a look in here. And I don't know what you think about it. But again, it looks like all the voltages are going up. And using my cursors here, I can see it takes 34 milliseconds for all the voltages to be up. I do see the 12 volts here is kind of overshooting a bit. Not by much, but it is. is. So if I really wanted to consider that, I would say 40 milliseconds. It feels like a reasonable time to me. And again, then I don't see any other issues within the voltages. Actually, no, I'm looking at that. Minus 12 is kind of struggling a bit. So this is actually taking like 115 milliseconds. It still feels like a reasonable time, like 100 milliseconds for, for the voltages to come up. My only reference I have is the reset line is, is waiting to 250 milliseconds between the power the voltages are good and the moment the reset line actually disengages but i was hoping to see some real struggle because we are talking about 0.4 volts here of difference between the moments where it looks like it's coming up which is here and the moment it's getting better which is there it's only half a volt and by the way on this occasion the Macintosh hasn't started up it's stuck on the gray screen at the beginning so I don't think we've seen anything weird on these two occasions and honestly I don't know why this is happening the next test I want to do is to check the reset line and also to check whether the reset line actually happens in the time that the manual says, the hardware manual says. So my yellow trace is going to be my reset line. So let's power up and then we'll have a look at those traces and see what they mean. Go. Here on the left hand side you have all your voltages besides minus 12 I think. They're coming up online and in yellow you have the reset line. Now the reset line is basically active when it's low. The moment you give power, it is actually active, it's resetting the whole thing. And is stopping the reset, so the reset goes away for the system to boot up only when all the voltages are fully up and running. The hardware manual says that the reset line is supposed to disable itself 250 milliseconds after all the voltages are fully up and running. So let's see and measure the, the distance between uh, the reset line and uh, the moment the voltages become fully available. 
Well, this is 250 milliseconds, and while this is definitely within the voltages being more or less up and running, I have to admit that at least a plus 12 volts is really not fully up and running. But again, it's not too far away from where it's supposed to be, so I'm assuming from a logic perspective this is fully up and running. And uh, again, I feel this is fine, this is probably what you were expecting to see. And by the way, on this occasion, the Macintosh hasn't booted up again. It's been happening more and more <laughs> recently. Uh, what usually it needs, it needs a reset from the motherboard and then usually powers up. Now on further tests, to be honest, I've seen, I've noticed that even by resetting the machine after it's powered up, sometimes it still fails to boot. It might take more than one reset. So power up and then two, at least two resets to actually boot up or post, if you wanna pull it, call it that way. But at least that now we know the power supply seems to be fine, at least from uh, this diagnostic, and the reset line seems to be fine as well. Now, one thing I've noticed is when the Mac refuses to, when it gets stuck on that gray screen, the ADB is completely dead. So here we are seeing the ADB bus and it's completely dead. There's no communication, neither from the computer nor from the peripheral. And these are the lines going to the VIA. And again, they are absolutely and completely dead. Now, something is going on with the system because this is one of the data lines on the processor and there is some activity. So something is happening, but the ADB somehow is completely stuck. So I now start to feel that maybe the computer not booting up could be a bad VIA or the ADB refusing to initialize. Now, if I reset the computer, checking the, the ADB bus, assuming it's gonna boot up now, I do not know. Let's see what happens. So the bus goes down and immediately you see activity. So it doesn't take long for the ADB chip to look into the bus and ask the peripherals, hey, who are you? What's your address? I'm giving you this address. And if I now move the mouse, I see activity. So as you can see, the moment I push the reset button, the moment you see the ADB running, it's like one second. And now obviously the computer has booted up. Okay, now we know the power supply seems to be working. Now let's pick up from my previous video and let's move to the ADB bus again. Now, now I have a keyboard and the mouse both connected together to the computer. There's something I wanted to check to see, you know, whether the ADB chip is healthy or not. If you watch my previous video, you might remember that when the system boots up, it somehow defaults to the keyboard. He's expecting the keyboard to send some information. So the address I got here is 0010. And what we notice is that if I touch the mouse, that address changes to the mouse address, which is, or should be, 0011. So if you check this bit here, which is a zero now, it should turn into a one in a moment. There you go, so it becomes 0011. So my curiosity is, is now the system frozen? So the ADB is not doing anything anymore? What happens if I use the keyboard? Does it go back to 0010? Let's give it a go. In three, two, one, go. And yes, it does go back to 0010. So the keyboard is requesting permission to talk on the bus and the computer responding saying, hey keyboard, I'm hearing you, please go ahead and talk. So when the computer boots up, the ADB, at least this side of the ADB, seems to be healthy. The last thing I wanna do before this video becomes too boring is to try and capture some keystrokes from the keyboard. What you see on the screen is the ADB bus, the partial signal on the left-hand side of the screen. We don't need it right now. That's basically the motherboard talking to the keyboard. Now, if I press the A button, you might see something appearing on screen and that's the basically my keystroke appearing on the ADB bus. Now, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna trigger the oscilloscope so that gets posed on screen. There we go. So again, this part here is the computer instructing the keyboard to use the bus. This part here is the keyboard using the bus. According to the manual, after the ADB chip has authorized the keyboard to use the bus, you have a start bit, you have a stop bit, and then you have between two and eight bytes of data. And what I found is that the keyboard is sending two bytes of data. So this section here is the actual data sent by the keyboard to the ADB. Now the first bit is the start bit, the last bit is the stop bit. The one in between is the actual keystrokes happening on the keyboard. Now the keyboard has the ability to send two keystrokes at the same time. If you think of control C, for example, it needs to be two of them. These are eight bits 
so it's two bytes. The first section, the first byte is going to be one bit, is going to be whether the key is, has been pressed or depressed. In this case it's zero, so it means the key was pressed. So I captured me pressing the key in that moment. The remaining seven bits is going to be the actual key and we have all zeros. Now all zeros happen to be the code for letter A, uh, which is exactly the key I was pressing. The second part, or the first part, if you're looking in binary, is going to be one depressed. And then you have all ones, which I'm assuming it means there's no second key, basically. So we can ignore the second part. I'm only pressing one key at a time. I think this is complicated enough. Now, to confirm my analysis, let's try with a bit more complicated key. If I'm looking here on the keyboard, I have A, which is 0, 0. Uh, let's get something like M. M is 2E, okay? So it's gonna be a bit more complicated. It's either my logic works or it doesn't. So I'm restarting the oscilloscope now, and I'm gonna type M and try to capture the letter M. We have the same start bit, the same stop bit. We don't care about the right-hand side of the, of the data. So we care about this. We have a zero, and again, zero is down. So that was the when the key was pressed. And then we have 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0. And 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0 in uh, hexadecimal is 2e. So this was a quick way to show basically that the communications between the keyboard, the mouse, and the ADB chip are working perfectly fine. So the issue must be on the other end of the ADB or with the VIA. If I had to choose whether to replace the VIA and the ADB, I would probably think the VIA, because the ADB, at least on this end of the communication, looks to be working totally fine. So it seems that either the VIA or the ADB chip are faulty on this machine. I would think of replacing the VIA first. When I realized that, I started looking online and I could find some VIAs from China, not at a reasonable price, I would say, and also pulled from machines, so you have no idea whether they're working or not. When it came to the ADB, that's a custom chip, and again, I couldn't really find anything online, so I thought I was stuck. But then I found a very, very healthy and active community online, and I found um, two very valuable information. Well, the first one is the, the VIA here. It's actually a rebranded, I think this is a Rockwell, and it's been found that this is equivalent to a chip manufactured by WDC, which is Western Digital Design, which is selling exactly as a VIA, versatile interface adapter, and can be purchased brand new, currently only from Mauser in the US, at least is where I found it. They have plenty of them and they are £8.98 plus shipping, unfortunately. However, my good friend Lee was kind enough to lend me a replacement chip, which is coming from a, a working Macintosh computer. So I do have a spare which I, can, which I can try straight away, but if that works, I just need to replace it permanently with a working WDC and the code of the chip is W65C22N, which is a drop-in replacement for the VAA. Now, when it comes to the ADP chip, I found not one, but two different options. But the first option is an adapter, which was designed by Kai Robinson, who, if I understand right, has quite a lot of experience on these machines and he's the, the father of so many very complex and knowledgeable projects on this machine, including, if I'm not mistaken, the reverse engineering of this whole motherboard, which can be purchased brand new. He designed a small adapter, which allows to adapt this type of package with the PLCC version of this package, which I happen to have on my very own damaged SC30 machine. So at first I thought I can just remove this chip by the adapter and just replace this type of package with the PLCC and that should work. But then I discovered that someone actually went ahead and managed to recreate this chip using a PIC. PIC can stand for Peripheral Interface Controller or maybe programmable intelligent computer. Well, don't ask me what that means and how it works, but all I know is that I need one of this, which is a PIC16F87, but the 88 is gonna work well as well. I do have a, I would call it configuration file for this chip. I need to program it using my programmer, and then uh, this little chip here becomes a direct replacement for the ADB chip. I was actually amazed by the amount of options I had, uh, especially considering at the beginning, I thought I was completely stuck. 
What I'm gonna do next, I'm gonna remove the VAA and also remove the ADB chip and I'm gonna socket them using turn pin sockets. The reason I'm gonna use this is that especially the VAA is, is being pulled by an existing system and even though the legs actually are reasonable length and they are pretty straight to be honest, normal sockets usually don't like older chips. I'm gonna replace the VAA first, which seems to be the, the dead one, and if that doesn't work, or, or regardless to be honest, I'll replace the ADB as well, even just to see whether the, the chip I purchased works and the programming of it uh, works as well. But let's talk in them first and we'll move from there. Okay, so I've got the VIA and the ADB socketed. The ADB is the same chip. The VIA is the replacement chip that I got from, from my friend. It is uh, ready to power up. I got mouse connected. So first of all, will it boot up? Because I have a feeling the VIA was respons is responsible for boot up issue. Secondly, if it does boot up or when it boots up, will the mouse work? Let's test it out. Well, it's not booting up, uh, it requires some reboots or whatever, which is not great because I was hoping the VIA would fix both this problem and the mouse. So now I'll have to power cycle it or reset it a number of times until it comes to life. And as you can see, it took me a lot of resets and power cycles to finally get the Macintosh to work. It all started as a minor glitch, requiring an extra reset every now and then, but now it's snowballed into this major issue. Well, it's taken me many, many, many reboots, I don't know, 30 and several power cycles to get to this point. I don't know. Anyways, mouse cursor is there. Will it work? I don't think so, to be honest. Ah, oh, it doesn't work. Well, <laughs> the only thing I can do is the next one is to try and program this um, PIC chip and, and see if by any chance by replacing the ADB chip that causes the system to start working for whatever reason. Programming the chip is fairly easy. All I need to do is to place the chip into the programming like this, close the lever or lever. Then I need to select the chip in here, which is already selected, I think, PIC PIC uh, 16F87, yes. And at this point, I need to load the, the hex file that I found online. And I hope that these options are correct. To be honest, click on OK. I can see that there is some code or configuration, whatever it is for this type of chips. All I need to do is basically to program it and click on program. And everything says succeeded, everything happy. So in theory, this should work. So all I have to do now is to grab the chip from the programmer and replace the ADB chip on the board. ADB is replaced, let's power up and see if anything changes. Three, two, one, go. Well, it's put it up straight away, even though it's been on for a while. So maybe that's why, maybe it's a good sign. Let's wait for the sad floppy drive or whatever and let's try and move the mouse. I would be surprised. Well, it works! It was the ADV chip, causing potentially the wooden issue, but also the mouse issue, and I thought the ADV was fine. Oh my gosh, this is so cool! I was wrong all the time. It's so cool, it's so nice to be wrong, to be honest. Yay! Okay, so the uh, original VIA is back on the motherboard. Let's power up and see what happens. First of all, I'm curious, does it power up straight away? It does, which is a very good sign. Right, will it work? It does. So, <laughs> so it was the ADB chip all this time. It wasn't the VIA. I blame the poor VIA and it was the stupid ADB chip. So let me publicly thank the person who actually came up with the code 
for that chip. Their name on uh, 65K MLA is Tashtari. If I'm saying it right, I guess it's, it's just a nickname. Thank you very much. Well, it's been a fun journey and you actually made my repair pretty cheap, to be honest, because I only needed, I think it was like three, four pounds of chip. I have a programmer, so it didn't cost me much. And I've now power cycled this Macintosh several times, even when cold, and I can confirm that the ADB chip has fixed both the mouse and the power up issue. If you remember, we noticed the ADB bus was dead when the computer was failing to post, and I thought that that was a symptom of the issue, but it looks like I was mistaken, and that was the issue altogether. What I think was happening is that the ADB chip failed to initialize, and somehow the VAA or something else within the system would refuse to continue if the ADB chip was not ready. Well, I'm so happy that both issues have been cured and now we can move on to something else. We've done a lot on this video already. I don't think there is enough time for some other major tasks today, but we have some time to replace the battery. The existing battery is a normal rechargeable soldered three volts Varta, but surprisingly, this has not leaked. And um, even more surprisingly, it still has 2.9 volts in it. Anyways, it's a ticking bomb, so let's remove it. Now, I could replace it with a half AA holder and another similar battery, assuming it fits. Yes, it would take 30 years to leak, but I'd like to use a coin battery instead. The usual CR2032 will do. However, a 2032 holder won't fit nicely as the original holes on the PCB don't really match any CR2032 battery holder. And even by bodging some wires, the holder would not rest nicely as there is not enough space on the PCB. So I thought about making my own PCB design, but I'm not too good at that. And I would certainly pay for something which would not work. Instead, I purchased some of these double-sided prototyping PCBs. I cut one to a suitable shape and then fitted the standard CR2032 holder on top, giving the holder a nice surface to rest on. Then I fitted these uh, interposer, let's call it that way, to the main PCB using a couple of pins, which I connected to the holder using some wires. A diode here is not required as the original battery is non-rechargeable, but there would be some space for one if needed. I like the outcome, it's uh, relatively elegant. My friend Lee suggested I used one of these half AA replacements and fitted a couple of pins to the sides of the battery so it could be installed directly onto the PCB. I thought there was not enough clearance to fit the battery vertically, but apparently that works. It does look like a nice alternative, but I had already fitted my solution by the time I heard of this option, so this will do for this machine. Which solution do you like most? I'm curious to hear from you, why don't you leave a comment down below? After fitting the battery, I tested the Macintosh, and the time was retained after power cycle, so that's another tick on my list. Well, I think I'd like to pause this video here. I'm trying to keep my videos a bit shorter than usual, say like 30 minutes maximum, rather than maybe 40, what, uh, what I've been doing so far. Uh, it's always a bit of a compromise to try and squeeze as many information and events as possible into a reasonable amount of time. In the end, I don't want to rush them. I want you to enjoy what I'm doing, but at the same time, I don't feel like having like an hour video is going to be productive for, for anybody. So I would appreciate your feedback back on that if you don't mind if you could just leave your your opinion down below uh, that would be really great anyways i feel we've achieved quite a lot in this episode you know we fixed that major booting issue and the adb which was preventing me from using any keyboard or mouse and i felt that was pretty interesting i hope you enjoyed that and also we swapped the battery which you know it's definitely something that you have to do at some point now on the next episode we will have to continue and have a look at the floppy drive uh, make sure it works now we can use the mouse the hard drive and also take a look at the deflection the monitor which was showing that kind of instability so that's probably going to be the analog board and finally, at some point, this Macintosh will need a little bit of cleaning and proper renovation, maybe some razor brighting, uh, maybe a CRT swap with another one I have, uh, just to, you know, bring it back to the ancient splendor of this model. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, I would appreciate if you could hit the like button down below and also consider subscribing to this channel if you like what I'm doing here. For now, thanks for watching. I wish you a great day. And as usual, I hope to see you soon again here on my channel for my next video.
Goodbye.